A successful dentist, a family man, a pillar in the community, a man of God. But Colin Howell had an entirely different side to him, a much darker one. Colin Howell was born in 1959 in Portadown in County Armagh to parents Sam and Sarah. He was the fourth of five children with two brothers and two sisters. They grew up in Woodvale in Belfast and attended Shankill Baptist Church. Both of Colin's parents were from God-fearing families. Colin was close to both his parents, but particularly to his father. Um, he attended church three times on a Sunday and by the time he was 13 he knew that he wanted to be an overseas missionary. He attended Cave Hill Primary School and then on to the boys model which was a secondary school in Belfast. He was said to never be in trouble but he lacked confidence and self-esteem and he was considered an outsider. He wanted to study medicine but his B's and C's led him to dentistry. He would later travel to India and Romania doing free dental work. When he was 19 in college he bought his first porn mag and this would be the beginning of an obsession with pornography. He would go on to open a successful dentistry in Ballymoney in Antrim, um, where he would specialise in dental implants. In 1980, he would meet Leslie Clark at a church gathering. Leslie was born in February 1960 in Plymouth, England, to parents May and Henry. She had one brother, and uh, the family would then move to Dublin, and this is actually where the children would grow up. They were a respectable Christian family. Leslie would then go on to study nursing up in Belfast. She was intelligent and a good student. Colin was quite jealous and controlling when it came to women. In fact, at the beginning of their relationship, when it wasn't really an exclusive thing, uh, while she was out on a date with another man, um, Colin went by her house and stayed there until she arrived back with him and he threw the other man out in a jealous fit of rage. So Leslie and Colin were both devout Christians and this would have been his first serious relationship. And although sex before marriage was completely off limits, the couple were intimate. In fact, the couple would travel to London on three different occasions for Leslie to get an abortion, um, uh, her paying for all three of them. She would tell a friend that she didn't really want to go through with them, but that she was afraid that Colin would end the relationship if she didn't. It kind of amazes me um, sometimes the thought process between behind Christians and Catholics, other religions as well, but it seems to always, just that's who we're focusing on. So that's just who I'm talking about right now. Like the logic is the abortion is okay, but sex before marriage wasn't. So like you have to perform the abortion to which in my opinion is a worse sin than sex before marriage. It's just the, the thought process that goes behind the practices. The couple both had guilt over their premarital relations and then Leslie also had guilt over the abortions. The couple were due to uh, wed, but they both had doubts and reservations. But Colin felt compelled to go through with it anyway because he felt like no one would want either of them because they were now, you know, they were now tainted. They were no longer pure and that no one would want to be with them. So on the 16th of July, 1983, the couple married at Windsor Baptist Church on Lisburn Road in Belfast. Just to give an idea then of how uh, how strict both sets of families were, but all particularly Hell's family. Um, so Hell's parents did not want there to be alcohol served. Like, you know, when you go to a wedding and there could be like wine on the tables, that type of thing. They were like, no way. There's no, there's to be none of that. However, Leslie's father was like, yeah, of course it's going to be wed like it is going to be alcohol. It's a wedding. So for the reception, there was. Um, like a, a distinct line through the tables they were split in half almost like an aisle and one side served alcohol and one side didn't so just to give you an idea of how strict hell's family were and how strict their beliefs were in terms of their um the baptist practice so at first um the couple seemed very happy leslie particularly was you know very happy with her husband in fact she was at um like a uh, like a ladies bible study group you know for the for the wives and girlfriends and stuff like that and uh you know the concept of jesus came up and his virtues and stuff like this and they you know the question of you know who could be modeled after jesus and without hesitation leslie looked up and said uh colin of course Um, it will be said later that like a few years later at the same group that she would make a comment saying colin wasn't all he could have been the couple welcomed their first child in october 1984 and um, his name was matthew 
And so Leslie actually uh, made a decision then to stop working as a nurse and stay at home. The family settled in Coleraine and uh, they were quite involved with the Coleraine Baptist Church. The church elders were very happy and impressed with Colin's, you know, enthusiasm and commitment to, to the church. He was appointed leader of the Youth Fellowship and um, he would also drive the minibus then for any outings for the for the youngsters. And he also played in like the church group, like he played guitar. So he was just thriving, you know, at the church, his practice was doing really well. He was just he was just doing really well. Leslie, however, was um, you know, struggling to be, you know, a wife and mother at home. She found it quite isolating and unfulfilling. Colin was quite uh, controlling, as I had mentioned earlier, but Leslie, you know, didn't just typically submit to that, to the dutiful housewife. Um, she wasn't the best housewife in terms of, you know, she wouldn't have been the tidiest. She was quite bad at budgeting. She had no problem leaving the baby with Colin when she needed time to herself. I am not saying that that's a bad housewife. I am saying that that is what would have been deemed a bad housewife in the 90s in, you know, religious Ireland. In 1986, Leslie fell pregnant again, and at this time, her mother's health actually started to fail. And uh, just 10 weeks before their baby was due, her mother passed away. Their daughter, Lauren, was then born, and it's believed that Leslie suffered from postnatal depression. In 1989, their third child, Daniel, was born. So the couple started suffering uh, financial pressures. Colin bought a family home in Knockdale in Coleraine for £85,000, and this was at the same time that he bought the practice in Ballymoney. The house wasn't fully fitted, but the family moved in anyway, and it was said that they couldn't, like, they couldn't afford to put down carpet. Hell gave up, like, his, you know, extra sporting activities and stuff like that to try help at home with the children. But, like, the financial pressures were not helping the relationship. That Christmas then, uh, in the same year, 1989, Leslie found out she was pregnant again. And so she was suffering with, you know, she was struggling with the thought of four children under the age of five. But there was another strain on their marriage. Howell had had an affair around the time of Daniel's birth. It was with an old friend from uni who I believe was also married and it lasted for about a month. Leslie found out about the affair and this made her feel even more isolated and stressed. Howell thought of divorce but it was never really an option. Again, the affairs are okay but divorce is seen as a bad thing. And sadly this would not be the only affair. Hazel Buchanan was married to police constable Trevor and they had two children, a son and a daughter. They lived on the other side of town in Charnwood Park. The Buchanans also attended Coleraine Baptist Church. Um, so this is how the two families would have been familiar with each other. Hazel was an assistant at the nursery that um, Hell's daughter Lauren went to. She also looked after the young children at the Sunday school. She was shy and impressionable and it was said that she was also from a God-fearing family. So Hazel and Hell knew each other from, you know, from the church, from the social circles, and they would chat when he would drop his daughter off to nursery. This is where the relationship would develop. And in the summer of 1990, uh, Hazel, Hell, and some other mothers were at the Rita Leisure Centre for their, their children were having like swimming lessons. And so like most of the mothers would sit and have coffee and just kind of watch the children, you know, at their lessons. But Hazel was actually in the pool because she was practicing like her own her own front stroke or some stroke. And Hell was also in the water. So of course he helped her. So he would help by like holding her waist and stuff while she practiced. This was all while Leslie was at home pregnant with their fourth child, Jonathan. So weeks went on and their uh, flirting continued. Uh, one time in the pool, uh, Hell put his hand, he rubbed his, like ran his hand upper thigh across her like genital area up her stomach and then back down um, and then made a comment about something about having you know um, not having impure thoughts you know that um, he shouldn't be having and apparently Hazel said something back about you know that she wasn't she wasn't so innocent either there was then like a family outing to the beach at Castle Rock and um, which was organized by the church and for some reason Hazel and Hell both brought their children back to Hell's house um, to like you know wash the sand off the kids in the bathroom and stuff and somehow then they slipped into one of the bedrooms and shared their first kiss. As I said earlier Hell played the guitar in the church group and um, so he started actually giving Hazel lessons so he would arrive over with his guitar and um, I'm not really sure how much actually happened here but it is said that Trevor came home one day um, and like they were sitting on like opposite ends of the couch but that he kind of Trevor knew something was up and he wasn't impressed 
the first time they had sex was in June 1990 and this was in Hazel's house while Trevor was um, on night duty. Apparently immediately afterwards Hazel just like went into denial and was like did that really just happen like what you know what happened did that really just happen kind of thing and as it continued then like hell would show up like even when Trevor was there while he was sleeping you know after being on night duty he would be then sleeping in the bedroom and they would like sneak off to the utility room. Hazel would then tell her husband that you know she was going out shopping and meet Hell in nearby towns. They would meet each other out while running you know under the roofs that they were just out exercising. They would have late night phone calls so basically Hell would like ring and like not let, like he would dial the number and then not let it ring but on her end it would click. It wouldn't ring but it would click or something so she knew then to ring him back so she would ring him back when she could um then apparently on like your bill the itemized bill is after 10 minutes so after every nine minutes they would hang up and ring each other back and so they'd be on you know they'd be essentially on the phone then for like could be on the phone for an hour or so talking late in that summer hazel and hell met because they had a problem hazel was pregnant so apparently hell was never particularly careful when it came to his affairs and uh, Hazel didn't like the idea of having to wait nine months to see if the baby would be, you know, dark like Trevor or fair like Hell. Even though Hell then said, you know, that he would claim responsibility if it was his child, she wanted to go ahead with, you know, getting an abortion. And so he he went to, he went ahead with it, even though he didn't really want to, ironically, because he was afraid that he would lose Hazel if he didn't. So anyway, as we know before, Hell knew what to do, knew where to went, knew, knew where to go. Um, so they left for London. Hazel actually left a note on the bathroom for Trevor saying, going through a really hard time, don't worry about me, don't try and find me, I'll be back in a few days, I love you. I actually don't know what Hell done. I don't even know if he made that much of an effort to try cover where he was going, to be honest. So on the way over, they were very careful. They sat in separate seats on the flight and on the tube into London. And they actually only met when they were going into the clinic. So the procedure was arranged then for the following day. And after the procedure, um, I think like it was recommended to them that they needed to stay. She needed to, she needed to relax like and take it easy. But no, while still, uh, still essentially under the effects of whatever anesthesia or whatever you get. Uh, Hell had to like carry her out to the taxi to bring them to the airport because she couldn't stand. On the flight then, she was uh, tearful and weak. She then passed off the subsequent bleeding as a very bad period. That autumn, um, a church elder, Alan Topping, saw the pair at Castle Row Park. Um, so their cars were parked beside each other with their windows open and he could see them talking. He then later phoned Hell and, you know, expressed his dismay and Hell denied that there was anything going on. But Leslie knew. She had been, you know, extra aware or vigilant um, since the previous affair. And so their relationship was quite strained. She once found like a, a handful of 20p coins in his tracks buttons um, and obviously wondered like why he would need them. And it was obviously to make phone calls to Hazel from payphones she would hear him on the phone at night whispering. Hazel and Hell actually spent a weekend away together and he was able to get a friend to cover up for him and say that they were on like a golf uh, golf trip. And Leslie did actually contact his friend to, you know, to confirm that that is who he was going with and the friend covered for him. Hazel confided in one of the pastors, uh, John Hansford, about her concerns and worries that her husband was having an affair. So Hansford actually went to um, Hell at work and quietly, you know, said it to him and expressed the concerns and Hell again denied anything. But the pastor approached Hazel too. And although she had, she denied it at first, um, she then eventually broke down and admitted that they were having an affair. So Hansford went back to the Hells and waited with Leslie for Colin to come home. So Colin then admitted, yes, that there had been, they had a relationship going on. So Hansford, the pastor, told him that he would need to step down from all his duties and that he would no longer be allowed to take communion. Colin and Hazel were both adamant to the pastor and to their spouses that the affair was not sexual. Trevor, who worshipped his wife, essentially, um, was 
very angry you know when he when he found out when he was told and both him and Leslie were made to feel like shame and embarrassed of the affair which I don't get I don't understand why you're made to feel you know feel a certain type of way about the actions of another person Hazel also had to step down from her duties at the Sunday school and she was also not allowed to take communion. At first, the couples were no longer allowed to have, uh, Hazel and Colin were no longer allowed to have communication together and the couples, the two couples' families, were not allowed to attend the same uh, service. So one would have to go on a Sunday morning and one would have to go on a Sunday afternoon. Eventually, this was, re this was like relaxed, but then what happened was one family would have to sit like up the front on the left and one family would have to sit at the back on the right um, so this was to avoid kind of seeing each other ha interacting with each other Hansford was then you know counseling the couples and would again like that discuss the problems in their marriages that would have led to the adultery again I feel like putting blame on Leslie and Trevor you know like what kind of issues you had like you had brought to the relationship for the affairs to happen Leslie started on antidepressants and began drinking um, she presented a brave front when it came to family, friends, you know, people visiting, but she was really struggling and she just felt so isolated. So eventually then, Hal decides to admit that the relationship was sexual. Um, so he tells Hansford and they both go back to the house and Hansford, while Hal's like in a different room, kind of prepares Leslie for what she's going to hear. Colin then comes out and, um, you know, tells her that the affair was, had been sexual and she's just in stunned silence. Leslie then screams and like lunges forward at Colin and starts, you know, hitting him and stuff. At this point then the pastor is like, well, like my part is done, you know, this is you guys and leaves. Leslie, which just, <laughs> just annoys me because it's like, you got so involved, you had to be so involved in like a, a a couple's private relationship and then now it's like oh now it's at a tricky part I better leave Leslie then runs to the bathroom and like downs a bottle of painkillers when she comes out she's like incoherent she's not like standing properly and she takes the car keys and leaves and Colin lets her Colin then rings uh, the pastor again who comes back and they wait and Leslie does come back and Hansford convinces her to go to A&E with him um, any suicide attempt has to be reported to social services so they get involved and she is hospitalized for three days. Leslie tells a friend that visits her that she changed her mind, you know, because she knew like she would never leave her kids and she said she would never try to do anything like that again. She tried to get the overdose removed from her medical records, but like it wasn't successful, obviously. And at this point, hell, you think maybe he would be more considerate or something, uh, but he just lost all interest in the relationship and in the marriage in fact leslie started like doing like crash diets she started changing her hairstyle she uh, was doing sunbeds she was going for facials she was buying new clothes she was trying anything to get her husband's attention you know to, to get his interest again from november 1990 to march 91 um hazel and colin didn't have any contact with each other leslie and trevor apparently actually did meet up and they would talk and stuff um and Leslie apparently was worried that Trevor wasn't coping well with, with the whole thing. Poor Leslie, she just, like, she was really struggling with the whole thing. I think she was still quite paranoid that they were, you know, seeing each other and stuff like that. And apparently, obviously then as well, the fact that her husband was just not showing interest, not giving a, a flying, you know. Uh, so she would, like, take pictures of them in, you know, from happy times and stuff like that and be, like, showing them, shoving them in his face and stuff. And, you know, when he didn't care, she would start, like, cutting them up and stuff. Um, anytime he was on a phone call, she would, like, rip the phone away from him. Um, apparently, one night he woke up and she was just sitting there beside him, like, cutting all his, like, underwear up with scissors. She would, like, you know, drive after him when he went on runs and stuff like this. She was always just accusing him that he was out with her. But in March 1991, um, Colin broke and phoned Hazel one night. The two of them talked about how hard it was on their end, you know, not to see each other and, you know, all this. And so the affair began again. At the beginning of April, Leslie phones a friend and says, um, I'm telling you this in case anything happens to me. So apparently one night, the couple, Colin and Leslie got into a fight. 
Colin had gone to like B&Q or something with the kids to get like a curtain pole or something and it was just really busy so he was back late and apparently Leslie then just started accusing him that he it was because he had went to see Hazel uh, this type of thing now I don't really know why she would think that he'd bring the four kids along to see Hazel but again he'd done stuff like that before so um but they were you know they had a fight and she then decided to go take a bath and so they had been arguing and stuff and she went into the bathroom uh, and she was listening to like a tape recorder which was plugged into an extension lead that was then out, brought out into the hall and I think that I think the argument does kind of an account of it but I think the argument was still kind of they were still kind of arguing and he came in and he sat on the edge of the bath and he lifted up the plug off the tape recorder and I think they just kind of looked at each other in silence then and then I read I can't really describe it but like he like uh it says like that he hit it kind of against her and then like dropped it so that it would make a noise I think to scare her and it just even like hell will later say that that was kind of you know when Leslie knew there was something in his head maybe maybe that not thinking that he was capable of doing something but that he obviously had the thought in his head of doing something Leslie's father had actually moved to a smaller house um, in Castle Rock I believe maybe to be closer to Leslie while all of this was going on um, but at the end of April he his health was actually failing so he moved in with the Hells for a little while and one night um, Leslie and Colin came back to find him collapsed in the kitchen and the doctor would put it down to heart failure. Now Leslie was actually left over 200 grand um, again in the 90s so a lot more now and apparently she told friends she didn't tell them the amount but she said that she was now financially independent and that she was planning to leave Colin. She obviously then struggled with everything even more after the loss of her father. On the 13th of May 1991 the couple lay side by side in bed and Leslie turned to Colin and she said to him this is going to be over soon I'm going to heaven maybe you and Hazel are meant to be together I'll never get over this Trevor will never get over this. And as she turned away and went to sleep, this is when Colin said he had his eureka moment where he thought, I can help you. Hal put his idea to Hazel uh, when they were out in the car one day and Hazel's reaction was basically like what, like the, what the consequences would be if they got caught. So it wasn't this scheme, this crazy, like bizarre idea that your lover is thinking of killing, you know, killing someone it's well what if we get caught so he actually gave her a box of uh, lorazepam which is like a sedative and um told her that she would need to crush it up in trevor's food so on the 18th of may leslie fell asleep uh, on the couch in the living room at around 11 p.m this was actually a common thing now she kind of she kind of just slept on on the couch now colin um let the kids stay up longer than normal so he didn't put them to bed till about 10 p.m um, and so this was to tire them out so hopefully they wouldn't wake or anything then and then he locked their room with a hockey stick this was actually um, Daniel's second birthday and so Colin took um, one of the baby's bottles he cut it in half and he used it as a connector for a garden hose um, which he connected to the exhaust pipe of the running car he then brought the hose through the house and into um, the living room where Leslie was asleep. He put the hose under the duvet and Leslie started to, you know, kind of, she was coughing and stuff, she started to wake. And when she realised what was happening, she called out for her six year old son, Matthew. Hell then hopped, you know, kind of hopped on top of her and kept the hose in and shoved it, shoved it into her mouth and he felt her life leave her body. He then dressed his wife and put her in the boot of the car. He took um, pictures of the children and he took her Walkman. He then drove over to Hazel's house. He parked in her garage and he brought the um, same hose up to their bedroom. And so Trevor was obviously in like a drug induced sleep. So he put the hose in and so same thing, put the, you know, ran the car. Uh, but Trevor actually started to wake and so a fight ensued between the two of them but obviously Trevor was out of it so he was too weak to fight so again Trevor was able to 
shoved the duvet over him with the with the hose pipe. Um, this all happened while Hazel stood outside the bedroom door. Hazel then gave uh, Colin clothes to dress to dress Trevor. She took all the bed clothes and put them into the washing machine, and she got rid of the garden hose. Colin then uh, put his body also into the car, the blue Reynolds estate, and drove to Castle Rock. And he drove the car into the garage behind um, Leslie's father's house. So it was like a row of cottages known as the Apostles to his children who he had left alone. So later that morning then he actually phoned the police to, to see, um, you know, had there been an accident because he said that there was kind of different, different stories, different accounts. But basically he said like that um, Trevor had come over. I think he said there had been an the night before and that there had been kind of an argument between him and Trevor. And that Leslie then left with Trevor, this type of thing. So obviously they were looking for, you know, looking for Leslie. He actually asked Jim Flanagan, a church elder, to go check and see if she could be at her father's house, you know, grieving. So Jim Flanagan went once and like that was known at the house. Um, another elder or someone from the church, he asked them and they also went. And apparently when they hadn't seen anything in the house or um, I don't really think they looked in the garage, but like kind of looked around. Colin apparently was in a bit of disbelief, you know, as in like, like she has to, you know, she has to, has to be there like thing. And then Jim went back again and Jim obviously then found them and the police were called. He placed Trevor into the driver's seat of the car. Um, he left Leslie in the boot and put the pictures of her children around her and then put the Walkman on her ears and played the gospel music that was in it. He connected an old like vacuum um or like vacuum connect uh, hose pipe to the exhaust he left the car running and then he left so he ran ru he ran running he ran running he went running up the beach and to like a bike that he had left hidden and uh, so he cycled home so when jim came back to colin's house and told him uh, you know that his wife was dead he immediately went out to his children who were playing out the back and told them that mammy was now in heaven you know, and the children upset one of them said, like, when will she be back? Never. Like, without an, without a moment's thought, like, just straight in there. Both funerals would be held on the 21st of May. Leslie had previously written about her depression. And so uh, Colin was quick to take this note and use it um, after the murders. The deaths were put down as a suicide pact for, you know, brokenhearted and betrayed spouses. And so for almost two decades... Families, friends, and even the children of Leslie and Trevor believed that they had killed themselves. Howell received um, over £400,000 through the will, life insurance, and the money that had been left to Leslie from her father. So Colin and Hazel were both shamed, essentially, into leaving their church. Hazel started to attend Lima Vady Baptist Church, and Hell went to the Barn Fellowship. So they kept contact and after only six weeks, they were back to having sex. Um, so he would come over, you know, he would sneak over, leave his car kind of far away and then head to Hazel's. But neighbours saw and people knew. However, uh, their sex life was never the same. So the guilt of the murders made it impossible for Hazel to relax during sex. So she believed that if they didn't have a full penetrative sex, that they weren't sinning and that God would forgive them. Um, so they kind of made like a, a no, like full on intercourse pact. But the couple then found a solution. So um, Hazel was quite into her appearance and would get her teeth done and stuff, you know, uh, like scaled and polished and stuff like that regularly. And so she would go to hell to get it done, obviously, but she would go at night so that no one would see. And um, apparently she enjoyed the way the gas and air made her feel. You know, the nitrous oxide. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So um, apparently she would feel quite relaxed. And she found that her libido was actually raised. And so the first time, obviously, that they discovered this, they then had sex in his uh, dentist chair. And so then this became a regular thing. Um, I, I heard that... Apparently once she actually overdosed on the la on the, the laughing gas and um, like went ballistic and like jumped out the window of the dental office. So the couple were able to have sex this way and then she would basically come kind of back to herself without having felt the shame of the sin. 
Um, and then one time, to step it up a notch, at Hazel's house, uh, Howell injected her with, basically with a type of Valium, a sedative. He then proceeded to have sex with the barely conscious Hazel. Their relationship would actually continue for four more years, but Hazel, you know, Hazel struggled with the, the guilt of it all. You know, I think kind of what people would be saying, this type of thing, it never kind of, it never went away. And so she ended the relationship. And Howell actually apparently even proposed and she, she still wanted to end the relationship because she didn't want to take on um, his children and she didn't want to lose her policeman's salary. Sorry, her police, like the policeman's widow's pension. The widow's pension. So not long after this, actually, in December 1996, Colin met a different woman named Kyle Jorgensen um, at church. So she was an American who was studying here at the University of Ulster. She was studying Irish and she actually had two children from a previous marriage in back in America. Um, so they started seeing each other or, you know, got together in December 96 and they got married in May 1997, like six, six months later. And so along with her two children and his four children, they went on and had another five children. So there was 11 children then in the, in the home. In the summer of 98, then shortly after she had given birth to their first child, Eric, uh, Colin sat her down and told her what he had done you know, the, the seven years earlier. He convinced her not to say anything for the sake of her and the children, you know, because there'd be no one then to look after her and the children. Like again, it's just him controlling and manipulating. So they were married for 12 years, you know, happily and things were going along. He was just still this great, you know, man of God and all this stuff and a pillar in the community, all this jazz. And then some things happened in his life that made him change his perspective. In 2007, his eldest son, Matthew, fell 40 feet from a balcony in Russia. Um, he was actually on an exchange here studying for a language course. And Hell believed that this was the son being punished for the sins of the father. He confessed to Kyle about um, an affair that he had. And so at Christmas 2008, she threw him out of the house and he rented a caravan in Castle Rock. And then he lost 350 grand uh, on a scam uh like basically like these people in the philippines were saying that they knew where like this hidden gold was and so you know i think it was kind of like you invested in it and then you would get your gold this type of thing but obviously he lost all the money so he lost all their money he lost all their savings he lost everything and again he believes this was all punishment for his sins kyle allowed him to come by every night to read you know to the children before bed and so she she urged him that he needed to repent for his sins you know everything that had gone on that he needed to repent and so eventually he he agreed to so on the 29th of january 2009 and um, they called the church elders graeme sterling andrew brown and willie patterson from the barn fellowship they arrived over early that morning at around 8 or 9 a.m and hell in distress told them everything so for over an hour he talked about the affair that he had had in 2002 and then it started again in 2005. And so he would tell Kyle that he was like, you know, going to work, but he was actually going to see this woman. And again, like previously with Hazel, he insisted that there was no um, sex. This is the affair that Kyle knew about. And this is why um, he was thrown out then at Christmas. He spoke about his online um, pornography addiction. So like it had come to the stage where, you know, he, he was spending all his time. So any free time he had at work, any time he had at home, um, it was all just used on the computer. He spoke about the three abortions that Leslie had and he spoke about the abortion that Hazel had. He spoke about how he indecently assaulted um, female patients that were under sedation at his office. After this, he began to uh, lose momentum, so to speak, with the confession. And so Kyle read like passages from the Bible and stuff like this. At this point, he stopped making eye, eye contact, but he continued. And so he told them about on the 18th of May, 1991, how he had killed his wife and his then lover's husband, how he made it look like suicide. He told them how Leslie called out for their son. At 10.15 a.m., Willie rang the police and Kyle said to Colin, you sucked the life out of Leslie. And that's what you do, Colin. You suck the life out of people. They assured him that his children would be looked after and they sat there and held hands and prayed. When the police arrived, Hell waited outside while Willie Patterson told them what um, Hell had admitted to doing. 
the decision was made to arrest him and when they went outside they couldn't find him so at first they started to worry because they thought maybe he had jumped from like the the cliff out by the house this type of thing but then he appeared from one of the bedrooms with a sports bag ready to go he was arrested and driven the 15 minutes to the police station where he didn't say a word in the meantime hazel had remarried a senior police officer david stewart so she was now uh, hazel stewart and um, she had met him at the gym so they didn't have any children together but you know uh happy life and all that continued on until the police showed up at her door in 2009. Hazel denied being involved in the murder, although she admitted to knowing the plan and admitted to helping cover it up, and she admitted to doing nothing to stop it. She said that she was afraid for her and her children of Colin. Her husband and two children uh, supported her throughout the trial. So she was out on bail and Hell was on remand. The trial took place in 2010. Hell said that Hazel knew exactly the, what the outcome would be from taking those tablets off him and from what the plan was and like it was pointed out like she you know she was part of it she knew what was going to happen she was there when he'd done it at no point did she not let him into her house at no point did she phone the police like she was she was part of it hell would plead guilty and be sentenced to at least 21 years Hazel pled not guilty and received at least 18 years. Hazel has failed several appeals um, to get her conviction overturned. Howell also received five and a half years um, for the sexual assaults on five of his patients between 1998 and 2008. Just some updates then really on the whole thing. Um, an Irish Examiner article from 2009, detectives were investigating the death of Henry Clark, that was Leslie's father who had collapsed 12 days before and died so it was put down to heart failure but they um believe maybe hell could have been involved now particularly because of the money that leslie was to inherit which then if he was to plan the murder of leslie he would inherit which he did hell denies any involvement in the death of henry um a bbc article from 2013 says that kyle jorgensen who had obviously kept her husband's secrets um crimes a secret for over a decade that she would not be um she would not be that she would not face prosecution and um, she actually left with the children and went back to america after his arrest and she filed for divorce obviously um a belfast live uh news source from 2016 said the hell would not receive his five hundred thousand pound pension from like for the, the dentistry um as a result of being convicted for the assaults against his patients in an article from the mirror in 2016 lauren is the only um one of hell's nine children to visit him she also attended the trial of hazel stewart a bbc article from 2011 found that the original investigation had been deeply flawed so apparently forensic evidence was not collected there were injuries to trevor's face that hadn't been documented and um, there was inconsistency inconsistencies in hell and hazel's story um, and these were not challenged and apparently trevor's leg was like outside of the door the door was open and his his um leg was, leg was out so obviously i don't know that must be a weird like for that type of suicide with carbon monoxide poisoning it must be strange to do that from a sunday world article this year um hazel stewart it has accused um colin hell of raping her so he you know and basically that she was under his coercive control so the point has been made that coercive control wasn't really a thing back then like it's really only coming into law now i think i think here in the republic it, we had like one of our first cases only recently about coercive control um so that's obviously kind of the argument they're making she still maintains her innocence and uh but the point then in the article is made that during any of her police interviews or anything she never she never brings this up she never says any of this stuff so that is the story of uh the killer dentist double murderer colin howell it just amazes me as i said earlier it just amazes me like the logic that goes behind some religions practices i i i hate people who like bash people who are religious i really do i hate those type of people and so that's not what i'm doing but i just think when the logic comes to and it's not it's different religions but when the logic is well I can't divorce can't divorce you so i'll kill you you know this type of thing like because divorce is a sin but murdering you isn't because like really it comes down to the whole shame thing doesn't it because 
If you get divorced, ooh, people will know you got divorced. But if you think you can get away with murder, no one will know and no, you, you don't have to feel shame for that, that people are putting on you. Whereas really people should be allowed to just move on with their lives alive and happy. But yeah, just obviously the murder, the divorce and the murder and then like uh, the sex before marriage and the abortion and all, just the, the priorities. Anyway, I'm not trying to say that they're all like that. Obviously, obviously one of the, the pastors had then made the point of saying that if they wanted a divorce, they could have divorced, but that for the two couples, that wasn't an option. But even then you're talking about like, hell would probably be thinking like well how does he explain to his family like how would he explain to his god-fearing parents that he's going to get a divorce and that he cheated of all things and um, i actually came across this case i didn't know about it apparently it was at the time it was called like the castle rock suicides but i didn't know about it until um i've started getting me and my boyfriend have started getting into watching uh shows and stuff with james nesbitt he's a an actor from northern ireland he's really good if you if you watch stuff that he's in he's very good um and so i think this is the third thing we found um with him in it and it was called the secret as so it was a drama and it was based around it was very much based around the affair with hazel and then obviously the subsequent murders and stuff like that it doesn't really go into a lot of the other things that he'd done or you know or like his previous affairs or anything like that um but it said, I think it said at the end then that it, it was based on a story. So then I just decided to start looking it up and uh, that's how I got this story for today's video. But uh, yeah, it's just a very sad story that like Leslie and Trevor's, you know, they both seemed to really want to make their marriages work. They both seem to be in love and faithful and devoted to their spouses. And not only was that not returned, they their lives were taken as a result so i hope you like uh, today's video again if you have any suggestions of any that you like to hear more about or anything like that please let me know let me know what you thought of today's video of today's case like that the whole kind of divorce versus murder thing and yeah so we will see you in the next video thanks bye